Hey YouTube, it's Extra GGA here back with another God of War video. This one's gonna be a little bit different than the previous gameplay videos that we've done in the past. And today's video is actually gonna be us going through a little bit of that lore, that God of War lore that I need in my life. Now, if you've never seen me play the previous God of War videos, please go check out that playlist and make sure you subscribe because we're so close to 500 and I would love if we get to 1,000 by the end of the year. But let's continue with the God of War lore and let's jump right into it. All right, so bear with me as we go through this entire video because most of you, now more than most of you, if you've been here for the God of War series, you know the lore. You know what happens in the sacred God of War lore. I don't. <laughs> I really, really don't. And I'm sure some of you noticed that when I played through the game, but I want to learn. I want to expand my mind of the ways of the God of War. And so that's why I'm doing this video to educate myself and maybe, maybe we can learn something together. But I would love this to be an open conversation. So if you have things that you would like to share, please do so as the comment bar is free for everyone to participate in. And let's go ahead and jump into who the heck is Kratos. Kratos is is essentially from what I've learned he was a Spartan warrior and he then became to be a general what, what like the what the heck he became a general and he had a family and he had a kid and unfortunately very unfortunate circumstances he ended up killing his wife and daughter who he loved a lot because he made a pact with this Ares God this God of war the OG of the OG the God of war so when we look up at here on Google obviously Ares the uh, yeah, let's just do Ares God of War. You can obviously see a lot of pictures that are half naked. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Ma'am, these very rips. Hello? Hello, avert your eyes. Anyways, continuing on before I get too distracted here. Um, a lot of this is the OG God of War. Essentially, they all depict him very strong, very just violent and full of rage all the time. It reminds me of someone. It reminds me of a little bit of Kratos, right? And so after this pack that unfortunately led to Kratos then killing his wife and daughter, he wanted to seek revenge after this Ares god because he was kind of bamboozled. He essentially was like, I don't want to do this anymore. I am not your servant and then wanted revenge and then later on became the god of war because he went on this mission to kill Ares. Ares to be the new and improved God of War. All of the lore essentially of God of War can be just pretty much spread out between all of the eight games of God of War, of Kratos. And so from the get-go of the beginning of that all the way to what we know of the newest game of the newest installment 2018 of God of War. Now Ragnarok is going to continue on the story but do we necessarily know what's going to happen? There's been a few theories and we will get to those exploring the theories not concrete details yet, but we will explore this series a little bit later on in this video. So why the heck was Kratos' journey so, so dang difficult? Well, the reason what I found was that Kratos' journey was so dang difficult is because he spent most of his life just kind of hiding. And a lot of that was hiding revenge from the gods who sought revenge of Ares, essentially. And so feel free to expand more onto this in the comment section, but it looked like he just struggled a lot. And I saw this in, in God of War 3, where a lot of it was just him killing off a lot of other gods before they killed him off and it was just a lot of pent of rage just he just popped off on a murdering spree where he just did the unspeakable and it was it was Kratos, it was God of War. But what I do wanna talk about a little bit more into this video is his weapons. The weapons that Kratos rocks throughout the entire games are very unique and very special. So essentially we start off with the very first weapon of Kratos. And for Kratos, that is what Kratos, I believe that was the Blades of Chaos if I can spell blades. <laughs> blades of Chaos. And I'm sure you've seen the pictures of these, but ooh, that's a good picture. The Blades of Chaos. And these Blades of Chaos are essentially the, the ones that Ares gifted him to be able to just murder everyone out there. <laughs> Every murder he did to beat his war, to defeat his enemies, Kratos' enemies, and the enemies of Ares were essentially with those blades. And unfortunately, these, if I can find a picture, these were actually seared onto 
Kratos here. As you can tell right here, these were necessarily just strapped, dap, sealed right onto those forearms. And it wasn't something that was necessarily like for aesthetic look, but it was something that was just permanently on there to just kind of resemble that he was a slave, contractually binded to Ares and his servitude. And so these were the first set of weapons. And next, if we look into Kratos' actual second weapon, from what I saw, we saw that his other weapon was the Blades of Athena. This is when the God of Athena actually gave him those those necks. So it was a Blades of Chaos and then the Blades of Athena. And so, ooh, look at that. Now there's, I believe, a couple of different renditions of this type of uh, weapon, but all kind of similarly kind of showing off the very similar similarities that they are still, regardless, blades and still seared onto the stinking forearms, you know? So I wanna see if we can find any cool, cool pictures here. I believe from the game here, we can see, yeah, these, the Blades of Athena. And most of this, I'm going to probably be referring back to the wiki, the God of War fandom wiki here. Pretty much, this is what they look like. And uh, yeah, they were the second pair that Blades wielded in the God of War series. And I believe after that, then we got to see the Blades of Exile, which were after the Blades of Athena. And I actually wanted to get a bit better picture. Uh, Blades of Exile. Ooh, these look really cool. This 3D render of that, that's really, really sick. I like that a lot, but Chaos, Exile, and Athena are the three blades, essentially. And I love that it shows that the different different designs and also different capabilities that these had. After this point, we see that we have no idea where re the rest of the weapons are, unless maybe you do. Feel free to comment down below. But from what I know, most of the weapons went somewhere. I have no idea but he ends up still having the Blades of Chaos. And this is where God of War, the most recent game of 2018, we see it where he gets to be able to pull out those blades and be able to use them. And the significance of that, being able to see a little bit of peak where, where Kratos is still holding on to that history, still holding on to where it all essentially, his journey began, where God of War started. And then we see in God of War, a little bit later on, that he actually wields the the Leviathan Axe. This Leviathan Axe we can see that has a uh, pretty unique designs on it. From what I saw, this weapon was actually really unique because you were able to see the frost, the frost markings in between. And runic, I believe these are the runics, right? The runic uh, designs here. Let me, I wanna see what the symbols mean on his axe here. The axe has several runes inscribed on the blade that grant him different powers, among, among them use of ice, the ability to recall the weapon from any distance. Also has two slots for arena attacks to be placed in, a heavy and a light attack for each slot. The axe pommel, pommel is customizable with pommels found throughout the realms and brought to Brock and Sindri. And so that's what we were able to kind of see in God of War where we're able to obviously collect stuff and then upgrade and such and be able to use the different runics. I was more keen on to not using the time one but I like to heal a lot because I was just getting just smacked around <laughs> in God of War and so I ended up going for that one a little bit more but as you can tell there's a bunch of just descriptions about which attacks you could have used in the game as well. And from what I actually learned of this axe is this originally actually belonged to Faye. I didn't know this until literally when I was actually researching this, that it actually originally belonged to Faye. His shield is a completely different story as well from protection. So as we look up to the guardian shield, which was the other weapon that he tend to use very frequently in God of War, we see that the shield was being able to use defensively like I 99% of the time used it defensively, but you could also use it offensively. And essentially you would able to be able to chuck this thing, kind of hit people, bounce it off of enemies and such like that. And um, that was really, really neat to be able to see that where you could use it defensively and offensively. That gave it a really unique aspect when fighting combat in God of War. I really loved this, that you could parry with the shield. It was a lot of fun to be able to do that. And from what I actually learned, another weapon, it's not even more of a weapon, it's more of an item that Kratos had in God of War from what I saw in the series, is actually his magic 
pouch. This is essentially from the beginning of God of War series, where this magic pouch is essentially the God of War version of the Mary Poppins bag. You know how Mary Poppins could have just whipped out pretty much everything and anything out of her bag? Well, Kratos has something and it's even smaller and it's a pouch and essentially carries it everywhere. And he was able to just shove all of his weapons and stuff in this bag. And when he needed a specific little, you know, weapon, he was just like, get it out of his pouch and just use it, which was pretty neat. Because I know over the eight games, he acquired a lot of weapons and a lot of items and he was able to just store it and have infinite, you know, the, the, the perfect solution to inventory was a magic pouch. And there you have it. So I would love to know what your favorite weapon was from any of the God of War games. Let me know down in the comments below and we can chat. And maybe if I haven't ever heard of it, I can look it up and we can walk through it together because I would love to know what your favorite weapon. All right, let's get into the juicy part of this video, which is essentially talking about the theories that already are out there for God of War Ragnarok. This is the part where I'm really, really excited because I did a little bit of research and I want to pull up some extra you know, some extra articles out here that talk about some conspiracy slash theories that are already out there talking about what Ragnarok is going to look like. And what I found is that one of them is going to be set essentially that Kratos and Atreus are going to, you know, are going to butt heads but turn on each other. This is going to spark some obvious events that could just take place of Ragnarok. This is going to start what Ragnarok rock is and so that's one of the theories but i also saw that there's obviously going to be a lot more enemies than from what the trailer shows the reasoning behind this is that we obviously saw that freya who oh, killed her son and thor seems just unbeatable and possible but if we're going to experience the north mythology then obviously odin has to come in at some point point. and so obviously there's a theory about the lego the the lego not that type of lego the logo <laughs> the logo that was published with Ragnarok when the game was announced that each room makes up the game's logo bring together Ragnarok obviously but according to Norse mythology these runes are known to be the main elements that give the power to the gods by Odin unlike the gods known in this sense we can also see different gods whom we will have to fight Ooh, juicy i'm excited because not only that but this year kind of goes into also that unfortunately maybe kratos might die or is it going to be atreus i feel like kratos has served his purpose in the games and i feel like he might be the one to die but this is all speculation and i don't know maybe is it too predictable to say that kratos is gonna die so that atreus or loki can take over I don't know. Is that going to be a possibility where one of them has to just be dethroned for another one to take on? Or will Kratos be invincible and just continue to, to carry on and just live on forever and ever and ever? Okay, so the next article that I pulled is this one from Android Central. And essentially, this the predictions from this one were interesting because it's kind of said the same thing as the last article that, you know, um, that father and son have gotten close, but it's not going to last. And then there's going to be this epic fight and yada, yada, yada. And we've heard about Thor and Freya. But what was interesting about this one is that it said that in Yotin Agraboda, or Grabada, Oboda, y'all are gonna fry me in the comments, it's okay. Loki's wife in myth is introduced in God of War Ragnarok. And in this trailer that we saw, we saw this girl. And who did we expect this young lady to be maybe Atreus's wife? Or Loki's wife, you know? And so there will be similar relationship blossoming in the future and it'll clearly take time to play out in a different way. The World Serpent and the Great Wolf Fenris are both sons of Loki and they both play key roles in myth of Ragnarok, yet the former unseemly has no relation to this Loki and Fenrir hasn't showed up yet. There's also a simple fact that the team of Sony Santa Monica are smart and no can't just do God of War 3 all over again. Make no mistake, there's going to be a lot of big deaths, but this isn't going to be a simple kill them all retread. 
which I agree in that sense that God of War was one that just went all balls out with just killing every god that there was and Kratos just went ham and cheese but I think that they're going to be strategic in telling the story and taking us to it for a journey throughout the story if God of War was masterful in its story and just the way they just gave us a wonderful adventure and journey then I cannot wait for what Ragnarok has in store. So what's also interesting about this article in particular is that this one kind of says that the Norse saga kind of ends a little bit kind of sort of and the reason why they say that is because of Tyr. Tyr traveled between realms loved by all the peoples and cultures and as a rescue of Tyr plays into the god of war it doesn't seem possible that here on out the story could abandon the idea of sagas associated with one particular mythology at all perhaps visiting numerous realms in one game. If so, while the main story here should be wrapped up, there could be a few secret plots, sec few secrets or plot threads left hanging in Nordic lands and to be visited at a later date. So, while this chapter ends, it doesn't mean I don't think that it's going to necessarily close this book forever, but I do think that they may explore some different end of threads that we may not have really heard of or have heard of but haven't explored from previous God of War games. Now onto this next article here, which I really wanted to pull out because of Thor here. I love what they had to say about Thor, and so that's why I'm including this article here in our video uh, from A Little Bit Human. I love, 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 love that they talked about Thor's character's design because when I saw this, I was like, okay, this isn't what I had in mind, but I love what they had to say because this is a thick boy. This is a thick boy. <laughs> it's a bit surprising because people expected and the character looked like Marvel's version of Thor, but instead we're getting uh, Thor from Avengers Endgame, which is also surprising because if you call a Thor statue depicting a god as muscular and toad in the first game, uh, Jormungandr 8. Oh my gosh, I'm butchering that up. I'm so sorry. But despite all the jokes and hate and stuff like that, that this this version of Thor guy, I just love that it just is going to fit perfectly into Ragnarok. And the article states that this fits a more realistic portrayal of Thor and what men in that time essentially looked like they were strong they were built they were thick you know they had bellies they weren't out here with abs necessarily but they were this is what they're built with these were warriors they were out here working the lands out here fighting and hunting and that's that was the reality you know and I love that they included Mimir called Thor a fat dauber in the previous game, hinting that the god doesn't have a slim sculpted physique that from the statue that the first game showed. This th representation of Thor, especially with the red hair, it has is a more accurate to the tradition in Norse depictions, which is pretty cool because these are kind of the pictures of what he kind of looked like. And uh, you know, they I love that this article included some of this this history here. What I loved about this article article is that it also talked a little bit about Loki's mate. Now Angraboda, Angra Boda? I hope I'm saying that right. I'm sure y'all will correct me. Feel free to down in the comments. I love that this article goes to talk about how we are going to get our answer soon enough, just like the trailer had said. But also what's interesting is that in North mythology, she's the Loki of mate, mother of Jay and Fenrir, and the grandmother of Skull and Hattie. There's already a relation, uh, there's already a hint that Atreus is related to Jay because I can't even say that name. In the first game, and Jay said that Mermir looked like Atreus look familiar so who knows maybe she'll be Atreus partner maybe I'm just excited in general to see what kind of part that she plays in this whole this whole game because I'm for it I'm for it all right we're gonna be looking at, into our very last article here which explores here in screen rant that a Athena is going to be the main villain, which is super interesting. I would have never thought about Athena. Athena coming back because she was in God of War and she was kind of haunting him and they had a, you know, a love thing in the series. And so it's going to be interesting that this, this particular theory says that Athena is going to be kind of the main focus of Ragnarok. The reason is that she's going to be posing as the main antagonist. And so there's a little bit of spoilers here. I'm sure most of you you already know this but obviously they talk about Kratos and Athena's relationship in God of War we see that it's kind of tragically degraded and, and just 
stuff went down. It went down real fast, you know, on his path of to kill the Olympians, especially Zeus and such like that. They're trying to break the cycle of the son killing the father. But I don't know if that's going to necessarily happen. But death was at the end of Athena. Um, God of War 3, the astral form guides Kratos towards his goal under the guise of freeing humanity. He successfully kills Zeus and Athena reveals her plan for freeing humanity in the soul qu queen quest of Olympus. The part that I wanted to read from this article is, However, when they opened the Pandora's box to feed Ares, its contents poured into the world which caused chaos and death that surrounds the series. Upon seeing uh, the open an empty box, Athena realized that the power of hope was now embedded in Kratos, hidden beneath his rage, grief, and sorrow. Kratos would come up to accept that he had to release a power of hope to humanity in order to save them from the chaos and destruction he had caused. The only way to do so was to sacrifice himself. Kratos impaled himself with a blade of Olympus as he laid on the, great, uh, the ground of pool of blood. Athena removed the blade and vanished leaving Kratos to finally die. So, did he somehow survive? And Athena coming back to be like, I'm back. <laughs> Guess who's back? You know, when he was wrapping his chains in God of War, it talks about how she was using his biggest insecurities, his biggest insecurities and his grief as her weapon. When Kratos raises, raises his blaze, now glowing once again in the fires of Olympus, the words, you cannot change, you will always be a monster, falls from Athena's mouth, realizing he must accept this part of him, Kratos agrees, but he states that he is her monster no longer. Before walking through her, he turns to the sphere of astral forms to, to form to embers. If exploring into this theory, I wonder if Athena would reach out to, you know, Freya to team up or actually just team up with Thor to beat to beat Kratos or even to team up to Atreus, you know, what way in this theory would she be able to meddle in to be the primary antagonist of this entire journey, the mastermind behind it all where she can implant her thoughts and her seeds of doubt or just wiggle her way into here where she's just creating chaos like she did in the past. I wonder in this theory if Athena would then reach out to to Freya to kind of get revenge or maybe even team up with Atreus to just overtake power. You, you're even try to talk to Thor to see if they can team up and um, kill Kratos. I have no idea. This, this theory kind of presents this interesting perspective that I would have never thought of Athena coming back, which this article kind of talks about something really interesting, which I thought was pretty cool. It says, Athena holds two important powers to make either scenario work. Um, ultimately talking about uh, talking with Freya and Thor ultimately how to make that work is the ability to possess objects and pyrokinesis the ability to control fire Athena may have possessed the blades of chaos causing them to always find their way back to Kratos and would explain why she appeared as he drawned donned the blades once more igniting them with his rage Athena is undoubtedly going to play an important role in the next chapter of Kratos' story. Even in the new land, the same struggles of his sons killing parents, hiding the past, seeking revenge are front and center. Athena has almost come to embody these themes. As more details of God of Ragnarok trickle out over the next year or so, a clear picture will begin to form, and one of these theories may just turn out to be true. So it'll be interesting to see if Athena is going to play a really big part or we'll see how big of a part she plays in this next game. All right, our last article here is an interesting one because it explores even more fan theories that I could find myself and just compile it into this one blog post, which is really, really awesome. It's from Hacker Noon and um, this one actually explores a little bit more theories back from April time. And one of them was that the giants are actually sleeping in Jotunheim and the reason Reason why is that this theory makes a lot of sense. The giants didn't seem to be defeated in battle and said they seemed to be sleeping as they were under a spell. Illusion has brought forward this interesting argument that Faye wanted her ashes to be spread to the highest peak in all runs of Jotunheim because her ashes, ashes would be responsible to wake the giants up from their slumber. Interesting. Now this makes sense to me because Ragnarok uh, to happen, giants must be there. This theory further confirms the above theory about Ragnarok. 
Hmm. Do you think this is actually true? Do you think that they're actually sleeping, or do you think that that, that this is the end for them and they're they're just they're out? They're not part of the story anymore. Another interesting theory that was brought forth from this article was that there are going to be two world serpents during Ragnarok. And this author goes to talk about how Atreus is holding a dead or unconscious Kratos and releasing something that looks like a huge snake out of his mouth. And in the game, this is the picture and this is what it had looked like. This essentially is saying that this could be the end for Thor. In the present time, the world certain will be sent back in time. The one that is stuck in time that would kill Thor after he's distracted. Well, this might be a stretch, but it'll be interesting to say the least. Whatever the case may be, we may know that Cory Barlog will deliver us with another masterpiece so it's super interesting to see what would happen if this is maybe this could happen i wonder i wonder what this all means here too all right, my friends, I hope you've enjoyed this video. This is all the information or most of the information I was able to just sum up together very briefly, not fully in depth in depth. But if you would like to share anything whatsoever or even correct me, please feel free to do that down in the comments down below. Once again, if you like this video, give me a thumbs up to help me out in the algorithm. Let's get to 500 subscribers or even to 1000 by the end of the year. And once again, I'm Golly G Ashley. I will see you in the next video. But don't forget to stay comfy, stay cozy, my friends. We'll see you later. Bye.